Hello everyone, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as Millimeter Peter, and today we're going over a segmented any percent run of Alium Isolation, and just how the world record holder Zeb beats the game in 22 minutes. Zeb put together this run special for this video, and he and another Alien Isolation community member named Infomaster also helped with writing the script to make sure it's all as accurate as possible. Alium Isolation came out in 2014. Wait, that can't be right. Oh my god, this game came out in 2014. Jesus fuck. Alium Isolation came out in 2014, and in it, you play as a Amanda Ripley, who's on a quest to find out what happened to her mama, but in the process, ends up doing an alien. For moviegoers like myself, this game takes place between the events of Alium and Aliums. So as mission one begins, Zeb holds forward and right and spams interact to insert a keycard the instant the prompt shows up. Important to note, Zeb has mouse wheel down bound to interact and mouse wheel up bound to crouch. This first mission is an introduction to controls. You mostly walk around and talk to various crew members to get to know them as the player. Up ahead, Zeb will get dressed at a locker and he'll hold backwards while getting dressed so that he starts moving a bit early and saves a little time. He'll then take a tight line around some corners and down the hallways towards an NPC named Samuels. There he'll walk into Samuels' room to trigger the dialogue and immediately back out of the room to get out of range of Samuels so he stops talking, before then moving back right next to the dialogue trigger but just outside of it. Initiating his dialogue and leaving the trigger causes Samuels to stop talking, and after a bit his AI resets. Not like his canonical Android AI, but his in-game AI refreshes, which you can see by him pulling a tablet out of a pocket dimension. Once Samuels resets, Zed Zeb will walk back into the dialogue trigger, making Samuel say his dialogue again, but it skips to his last line and saves roughly 6 seconds. He has to wait for Samuels to finish the line before he can leave the area, so he kills some time by bouncing on and through Samuels' D, which is a piece of tech I'll cover in a bit. Previously on Tomato Anus. I think I'm having an existential crisis. I'm actually here to make amends. Hey Minnesota guy, back from time traveling. Wait, who's this? Oh hey Chicago guy, this is Gavin Chainsaw Hands. Long story short, we had beef, but we just buried the hatchet. Can I move in with you guys? Real quick house meeting, Chicago guy? Yeah. I'm down if you are. Yeah, me too. Hey wait, real quick, have you heard of World of Warships, the free-to-play naval-themed vehicle combat game that's free-to-play on PC? I know you love vehicle combat. I do love vehicle combat. I know you also love new content, and they release it every month, like new ships, nations, cosmetics, and gameplay experiences. Whoa! Plus, this month only, you can battle as your favorite characters from Azure Lane with Azure Lane-themed skins. There's also more than 40 unique maps with dynamic weather, and multiple ship classes to choose from, like Historic battleships, aircraft carriers, submarines, and more. Can I play with friends? Of course, World of Warships has a super dedicated community with discussions on forums and Discord channels, and there's also live streams and tournaments to participate in. Holy moly! Oh, and did I mention it's also available on consoles? I know. Can I download it with the link in the description? Yeah, and during registration, use the promo code Azure555 to get a huge starter pack with 500 doubloons, 2.5 million credits, 5 days of premium account time, a premium container, and both commanders Cheshire and Azuma. I will! By the way, I got you this jacket while time traveling. I'm sorry for not listening to you and disregarding you, causing you to have the image of a buffoon. You aren't the bumbling roommate, Minnesota guy. Thank you for the apology, I feel a little better, and thank you for the gift. That was thoughtful. Hey, wait a second. Okay, Gavin, you can live with us. Sorry, Rocky Mountain guy, you're being evicted. Gavin's moving into your room in the attic. So Zeb will leave the room when he hears a specific part of Samuel's dialogue that sounds like this. This indicates the line is ending and it's okay to leave, and worth noting that this run is done with the Italian dialogue files. Italian is the fastest language to play in because it has the fastest dialogue, with French being second fastest. Zeb's now approaching an NPC named Taylor who he's going to do another dialogue skip with in the same fashion. He walks up to hit the trigger for the dialogue, then backs up so that the subtitles are lined up with the bottom of this silver part of the floor, putting him just out of range so the dialogue gets stopped. He then walks back forward until his crosshair is just before an imaginary line that you can draw between the top of these two rectangles on the ground, which puts him just before Taylor's trigger. He lines up his crosshair on another imaginary line at the midway point of the top portion of this door, and as soon as the door starts closing and passes his crosshair, he's going to walk forward to the door and look down. As soon as the door opens and passes his crosshair again, he walks backwards to hit Taylor's trigger right as she resets, causing the last line of her dialogue to play, saving around 26 seconds. Zeb waits for the objective to update before exiting the door to not cancel the dialogue, and heads down the hall to check to see where Samuels is at, since Samuels is supposed to walk this way and there's variance to where he can be. Zeb is going to walk ahead of Samuels and oh, for Samuels so that he doesn't have to stop and wait for it to open, then heads a bit more down the hall to 
a second time for Samuels. The only thing that's left to do now in Mission 1 is annoy Connor, an NPC who because of the sequence breaks Zeb is going to be doing, has one line of dialogue in the entire run before he dies. One line of dialogue and then dying. That's how I want to go. Actually, that's a lie. I've said for over a decade that I want to go out by being hit by a blimp. Not like a blimp crashing into the ground and killing me in the process. Just me walking down the road and a blimp flies really low behind me and hits me from behind and flies away. No other casualties. That's the dream. Zeb is going to interact with the prompt to finish this mission as soon as it becomes available. He doesn't spam the prompt though, since that can cause a minor soft lock and lose a few seconds. So the game normally takes place over the span of 18 missions, but in this speedrun, there's going to be some major sequence breaks. You see all these missions here? Cut it! Cut that garbage! Zeb is going to be skipping a ton of missions in this run, so the only ones he's actually going to play through are these. More on how he actually skips these missions in a bit. Also, if you'd prefer a run that doesn't skip all this, I've linked the 2 hour 28 minute world record of the all missions category by Shuriko in the description. Also, this run was brought to you by my patrons! Thank you, patrons! They voted on and selected this run to be covered on the channel, which is something you can participate in as well by joining at patreon.com slash tomatoanus, but more on that at the end of the video. <laughs> So after skipping the cutscene between missions, Amanda Ripley is now on the Sevastopol, a ship that's believed to contain the flight recorder from her mother's ship, meaning if she can find the flight recorder, she can have closure regarding her mother. Zeb's main objective for mission 2 is to get to a tram as fast as possible, and right away he takes the space suit off since he can't progress with it on. He holds back and right while taking off what he wants war to quickly activate and go through a grocery store motion door, where he'll walk a bit before looking to the floor to ignore a trigger for an explosion jump score. Uh, jump scare. That was supposed to say jump scare. After looking down, he's then going to enter and waddle through a vent to progress through the area. This vent is super linear, so he mostly just focuses on his lines here and being tight around the corners. Outside the vent, he's going to walk across a metal Little League bleacher seat to cross a gap, and he'll look down while doing so and crouch the moment his crosshair crosses a dark spot. The dark spot is a visual cue for when he hits a cutscene trigger where Ripley falls, and crouching before entering the cutscene causes him to technically be crouched during the cutscene and then exit the cutscene crouched. This loses a bit of time since he can't immediately sprint after the cutscene, but it makes up the time it loses and then some when he crouches to go through a TSA baggage check after rounding a corner since Ripley won't do her typical pause for a moment after crouching. This is because he was crouched for longer than one second as the cutscene played out, and being crouched for one second or longer gives you the pre-crouch state, where you can immediately crouch slash slide under objects. He's gonna pre-crouch before pretty much any time he enters a vent or low crouch space. So Zeb grabbed a flare right after the cutscene with there being a guaranteed flare spawn where he gained control, and through the run he's looking for flares and shotgun shells to spawn in random item spawn locations. At the bottom of this ladder was a random spawn that didn't have either, and the room at the top has two random spawns that also ended up having neither flare nor shell. Finding a shotgun shell in this category is like getting a snapchat from a girl as a speedrunner. It rarely happens, but is incredibly valuable and treasured. I'm back, bitches. Term of endearment. So here Zeb is supposed to interact with a generator and a terminal to open a door, but instead he's going to use the main glitch of the run. Crouch clipping, CC for short. So when you crouch up and down, for some reason, your position gets displaced, and spamming crouch up and down allows you to clip and phase through some walls and doors like you're a character in a movie no one saw. Pretty much you hump the door and the door lets you through. Crouch clipping is kinda a rhythm thing, it's not just scrolling the mouse wheel as fast as you possibly can. And each door has a different scroll speed required to clip through. This specific CC skips the generator and terminal I mentioned and saves 15 seconds, but we're going to be saving a lot more time with them very soon. Two things worth mentioning. Before he humps this specific door, there's an invisible barrier that's in the way that only disappears after this line of Ripley's ends and the objective updates, so Zeb has to wait for that before clipping. The second thing is that while he waits for this line to end, he's going to crouch to set up another pre-crouch in the second or so it takes for the invisible barrier to disappear. He has to set up another pre-crouch because pre-crouch is kind of built up like charges. He set up pre-crouch earlier during that falling cutscene, but then expended the charge when he went through TSA. So here he sets it up again while waiting for the barrier to disappear so that when he begins to CC, he doesn't stop moving for a moment. This CC saves around 15 seconds and is one of the hardest clips in the entire game, but for this run, Zeb got an insanely clean clip on it, getting through the door around a second faster than a typical good clip. He runs past this wire which has a chance to zap him, but getting zapped is alright since he can heal later on with a med kit. He checks for flares and shells here, finding none, and clips through this door's gap as it opens. He hangs a right here and then does two CCs in a row on some doors, which are considered to be two of the easiest clips in the entire game. They're what new runners start with when they're learning crouch clipping. Quick, remember where we are, remember where we are. 
Up these stairs, he'll clip through a shutter between the O and U and the word out. This puts him out of bounds on top of part of the level, where he drops in a specific spot to hit a trigger to activate a cutscene, skipping him to near the end of the mission. He leans to the side while falling, since leaning cancels out all fall damage. Also, that clip combined with the two right before it save over 9 minutes, skipping most of this mission. So he's now waiting for a tram to arrive and the mission to come to a close, which normally takes around a minute and 5 seconds, but there's actually variation in how long it can take to arrive, so lots of any percent runs are just sitting and praying for fast tram times, which according to Zeb is what he does best. While waiting, he shows off a little gimmick where he can move and lean at the same time by leaning while attempting to ignite a flare. Anyway, I know it's pretty early in the video to be doing this, but while he waits for the tram, I'd just like to say, as always, that I hope you're all doing well. If you're not, then please remember, as always, that no feeling is final. How you're feeling is not definitive, and you will not feel that way the rest of your life, nor are you defined by those feelings. Feelings of dread or despair are just where you are, and not who you are. There is a tomorrow, and whatever you're going through cannot take that away from you. You are so much stronger than you know or give yourself credit for, and whatever you're facing, you can get through it. Back to the run, as soon as he's able to, Zeb CCs through the doors as they open like there's a Black Friday sale happening in the tram, which brings him to the next mission. When he loads into Mission 3, he's going to pre-crouch while waiting for the tram doors to open. So Zeb had to do all of Mission 2 since getting to the end of that mission is the fastest way to gain access to other areas of the game. At the start of Mission 3, you can call trams to other areas in the game, which Zeb will do right away with a tram to Solomon's Habitation Tower, which is an area you normally head to after Mission 10. While he waits for the tram to arrive, he's going to do a quick loop to take a brace off a door and check a body for good loot. In this run, he only ended up finding a medkit that always spawns on the body. He'll use the medkit right away to top off his health while waiting for the tram since he done got zapped by that wire earlier. So, like I mentioned, he's taking a tram to an area that he's normally not supposed to go to until way later in the game. He's mainly going to this area to get a shotgun, since he needs a weapon for dealing with facehuggers later. Going to this mission 10-11 area this early is something you're able to do casually. You can go there really at any time, except you're typically just stuck in an area hub that's gated off from the rest of the level by closed doors. That's where crouch clipping comes in. Normally when you CC, you really don't scroll for long, mostly just short scroll bursts. In this area though, he has to clip through a shutter with an invisible wall in front of it, so two back-to-back -back clips, and clipping through both the invisible wall and the shutter requires a longer scroll. He's going to stand next to some Samsonites and move parallel to the shutter while scrolling to slowly clip through the invisible wall, and then is able to turn past the luggage and continue clipping to get through this shutter into the Mission 11 area. Having free scroll on your mouse really helps with this, but you can also roll your mouse upside down, which is something referred to as the race car or the Aussie strat. This clip is pretty awkward to perform. Also, he holds forward and right, which gives him a smoother exit to the clip once he gets through the shutter. Zeb is technically out of bounds despite it all being loaded. This area shouldn't be accessible right now. Just up here, he clips through a grate, which is the easiest thing to clip through in the entire game. Through the grate, he's now on his way to an elevator that he'll ride to the Space Flight Terminal. Funny enough, the Space Flight Terminal is part of Mission 2, which he skipped when he clipped out of bounds and dropped into the trigger. But it's only because he's now finished Mission 2 that the game has progressed to a point where a shotgun is now spawned in that area. Going to this area and getting this shotgun is something you're supposed to do in Mission 11, so right now he's already sequence breaking the game, but hold on to your pantaloons because it's going to break a lot more very soon. Here Zeb crouches a few steps before this door so he pre-crouches and is able to clip through with CC. If you don't pre-crouch, then you don't phase through the wall, you just dither up and down. Through this door on the left, he's going to pick up the shotgun through some fencing to warp to it and grab it without needing to walk the extra three steps around the corner. Neat little optimization. Now equipped with a weapon for the facehuggers later, he'll begin making his way farther back into this area, heading towards the main Mission 2 area that he was in earlier. Remember when I said 4 minutes and 20 seconds ago to remember where we were? Quick, remember where we are, remember where we are. Well, around the corner up here, he's going to be in a hallway where he'll climb under and through some objects, and at the end of that hallway, he's going to be at the T intersection that he was at when I told you to remember where we were. There, he's going to clip through one of the doors he clipped through earlier to get back to the concourse-looking area. In that area is a door he passed by earlier that he's now going to clip through, which will lead him to Mission 18. You can actually head straight to Mission 18 from Mission 2, but there's no known way to get through Mission 18 without some sort of item to kill the facehuggers. This is why he finished Mission 2, so that a shotgun would spawn, which he then picked up while returning to the Mission 2 area to get to Mission 18. 
So after kicking the frick out of this garbage can, he runs up to a door ahead while lighting a flare. After performing the difficult CC through this door ahead, he'll be confronted with another door right after that he's going to CC through as well, which is the most difficult clip in the entire run. That is, unless you throw a flare down at the base of the door. For some reason, that makes this clip like butter when it's normally insanely hard, and no one is too sure why. The clip put him into an elevator, which brings him straight to mission 18. The game automatically assumes that you've completed everything through mission 17, and you're put straight into Mission 18, complete with now having Mission 18 objectives. So pretty much in the story of the game, Ripley arrived to the Sevastopol looking for the flight recorder, and after going for an elevator ride in her search, the station is falling apart and there's now fire everywhere. Also, there's aliens on board. And she skipped the flight recorder. Here he's going to run up to some terminals and do a specific lineup while inching forward and spamming an Iract, which sort of clips him into being able to interact with the terminal despite not having a tuner. He spams inputs after finishing, which makes Ripley put away the tuner earlier, and from this point on, the alien in the level is active. Take note of how Zeb is strafing right as he moves to this other terminal he has to hack via a similar clipping method that he just did. The strafing is something called silent running, which is the piece of tech that's most easily abusable in casual playthroughs. Due to an unfinished animation with Ripley's character model, if you strafe right and walk, your footsteps don't make noise, and you can run without noise if you strafe right while running and tapping crouch periodically. Side note, Zeb walks while passing the working Joe on the ground and looks at it, since if it's not on screen at all when you're near it, it grabs you and you lose time. Anyway, silent running absolutely trivializes the game as the alien can no longer hear you and getting around is easier, meaning that you don't linger in areas as much with the alien searching for you and the alien never gets too aggressive. So in order to gain access to the full map, Zeb has to activate a terminal identical to the one he just did, which he's silent running to right now. Once he activates this terminal, two aliens spawn in the map, one who has a long scripted animation and one who has a short scripted animation and then lingers downstairs. He now has to head back downstairs and will pass one alien just ahead who isn't active yet and you can just sprint past. Zeb is normal running here, and when he gets near the bottom of the stairwell, he begins silent running and taking a very tight line to go around the pathing of the downstairs alien, which is currently running past him to go upstairs where it last heard him. This causes the two aliens to crash into each other like the North Tower hit the South Tower. Wait, that doesn't make sense. When he interacts with this lever here, the aliens, which the speedrunning community referred to as Steve's, despawn in the level, so if he's made it to this point, he's safe, although there is a scripted jump scare here. This brings us to a stretch of the run that Zeb described to me as, quote, the most depressing, god-awful part in speedrunning ever, unquote. I'm gonna pause for a moment to set the stage for this part of the run, because, uh... It's something. So we're in the final mission, Mission 18, which getting to on good pace is difficult enough. Keep in mind through the run, Zeb has had to do multiple crouch clips with some being incredibly difficult, and has also had tight windows on things like getting the lineup just right for hacking without the tuner, which, if failed, would require restarting the mission. So getting to this point in the run alone is already incredibly difficult, and to do so on world record pace is even nuttier. I don't like to be hyperbolic, but man, is what Zeb about to speedrun one of the most most fucked up things I've ever seen. To start, you're able to move forward while the screen is black while you're gaining control during the scripted cutscene. If you move forward, you can bump into a nearby egg which spawns a face hugger which kills you during the black screen. So if you're not focusing right off the bat, you'll just get the black screen followed by a death screen. After he gains control, he's going to grab a nearby flare for something later on, and that flare, it typically spawns but not always, and then he's going to take out his shotgun as some face huggers round a corner at him. It's the face huggers that make this mission so, so, so horrible. If you look right here, Zeb only has four shotgun shells, which is the normal amount of shotgun shells to have at this point. The shotgun only comes with four shells, and while you can technically find more throughout the run, in his hundreds of attempts of this category, Zeb has only found additional shells a handful of times. Like, literal handful. So you typically only have four shots. And you have six facehuggers to kill. And you have to kill all of them. The first two facehuggers come at him down this corridor, and he has to kill both of them with one shot. Only issue is that they aren't guaranteed to be near each other and killable in one shot. How neat is that? They often like to spread out and just make it impossible to hit them both with one shot due to how narrow the shotgun spread is. So if that happens, the run is over. So not only do you have to get super lucky with the facehuggers grouping up at one point, but you also have to time and land the shot during the short window where the facehuggers group up. Zeb is going to look to try and kill them when they're passing this A since if they converge, it'll usually be around there. These huggers aren't even the bad part though, this is just the beginning. If Zeb is able to clear out these face huggers just fine, then once he crosses this point on the ground, another face hugger is going to spawn at a random point of time. Zeb is going to listen for the face hugger screech 
which is the indication that it's spawned. Ideally, he hears it when he's passing through this doorway, with anything after that being considered a late spawn. Zebin tends to use this random spawning facehugger for something called a hugger boost, and if it spawns too late, then he has to stop and wait for it to catch up. So if you're in a confined space like a vent or this pathway Zeb has to crouch through, and a facehugger tries to latch onto you from behind, then you get pushed forward. The huggers have collision and they want to latch onto your face, so if they latch from behind, they move forward trying to get to your face as part of their attack animation. Because they have collision though, you get pushed forward really fast until they appear in front of you and complete their attack animation, killing you. Zed plans to do a hugger boost here to save a few seconds of walking, but he has to be sure to kill it before it completes its attack. This means that he has to hit it with a shotgun blast during these few frames where it's on screen. Like, this is those few frames at full speed. This is how short of a span Zeb has to land the shot. To time it out, he'll click to shoot while the boost is happening, which hopefully times it out so that the shot actually comes out while the hugger is on screen. Zeb said to me that he doesn't really have a concrete timing to this. He mostly just clicks during the boost and prays that the timing is correct. You may be thinking, wow, how wildly irresponsible of this world record speed Runner, relying on the power of prayer rather than figuring out and perfecting the required execution to properly time this shot every time. And I'd agree with you if it weren't for the fact that there's so much that can go wrong with this hugger boost. The hugger can be too fast, which causes you to boost just like a centimeter. This throws off the timing of the shot. The hugger can be too slow, which makes you boost into the flames and die. This also throws off the timing of the shot, but you're also on fire. The hugger can boost you into an object with collision, making you unable to shoot. This, uh, there's no shot at all. This and more run ending possibilities are possible for you too if you run Alien Isolation any percent. Call me right now, please. The strat is just janky overall. Also, Zeb is going to make sure he's aiming relatively up, since if you aim lower, the hugger will try to reach where you're aiming but gets blocked by the collision of the floor, putting it above where you're aiming. So say you're able to kill the two face huggers at the start with one shot, and kill the face hugger after the boost. That's three face huggers down with three to go, but only two shots remaining. The next hugger spawns shortly after where you end up with the hugger boost, and Zeb's goal is to look up and right and shoot the hugger while it's up there. Like I mentioned earlier, huggers have collision, and if you kill one in front of you, there's a chance its dead body can block your path. So if Zeb makes it to this hugger, he looks up and right so that the hugger tries to latch onto his face coming from that direction. So that way when he tries to kill it, it's out of his way over there. If you're able to make it this far, as Zeb puts it, you've got half the battle done because killing the last two face huggers with one shotgun shell is that tough. They're by far the most luck dependent part of this entire run. But they're not for a bit, so let's see how this segment with the first four huggers played out for Zeb. So after the fourth hugger, Zeb throws a flare ahead to a spot where two Steves are supposed to appear and you hide until they go away. Throwing the flare or firing a weapon in a specific window causes the second Steve to not drop down, and Zeb can then just sprint past the first Steve while it's completing a 20 or second so animation. In 26 seconds, he'll clip through a ladder instead of climbing down it since ladders are kind of like walls if you think about it hard enough, and similar to earlier, he leans as soon as he clips through to negate fall damage. If you don't lean within half a second of starting to fall, then you enter the falling animation and die. This trick is a big hurdle for newer runners since clips are unreliable with how fast they happen, so you have to be ready to lean within half a second of starting to clip or even 5 seconds after starting to clip, and also because new runners won't know exactly where the clip works at on the ladder until they practice enough. Up here, he'll bury himself in a corner on the right while a tram passes by, both making sure the tram doesn't kill him and putting him closer to the path he has to take. Also, this spaceship is big enough to have a tram in it, what the fuck? 
Zeb is trying to move smoothly despite difficult terrain and cuts across to the left here to keep moving and not wait for this tram to pass. He's then going to drop down into a hole in the ground and begin climbing up the ladder to get out, which initiates a scripted moment of Ripley almost going the way of someone who climbed a fence at an amusement park. After he climbs up the ladder is then the most horrible part of the run, the other two face huggers. When he climbs into a vent ahead, the final two huggers will come whipping around a corner, but they tend to come out at different rates and like to get spread apart. It's entirely luck based. If the face huggers don't come out together, then the run is dead on the spot and you may as well reset when you see just one face hugger around the corner. Plus, even when they do come out together, you have to aim and shoot in a specific spot, so even with good spawns, you have to just hope you hit your mark. So keep in mind that in order to get a world record pace run in this category, you have to get everything else I've gone over so far on world record pace, and then you have to get the luck of something that took 15 minutes of straight attempts to get once. Here Zeb CCs into the ladder instead of grabbing it, causing him to hit the scripted fall trigger slightly faster than if he interacted with the ladder. This trick also took several attempts for Zeb to get, and pretty much from where the huggers first made an appearance to now, the past 2 or 3 minutes of the run is where most runs die. Nothing like an insanely optimized speedrun where the game throws a million possible things at you 15 minutes in. So there's a gimmick swag strat up here where Zeb is able to defy all laws of how space works. Before putting on a spacesuit up ahead, he's going to light a flare in a small timing window, letting him have a flare lit in the vacuum of beyond. You can actually do this trick with a Molotov as well, and getting it actually loses a fraction of a second, so it's really just style points. You know what? I've been lying this whole time. You're not watching Alien Isolation, you're actually watching live footage of the start of the next Olympic torch relay. This entire spacewalk has no luck elements, thankfully. It's just a very slow walk to the end of the game to the final trick of the run. I assure you though, there is more speed tech coming up that can derail a world record run. While he makes his way there, I want to say thank you to everyone who made this video possible. My patrons. They're the ones who voted to make this video a reality, which is something you can do as well at patreon.com slash tomatoanus. For as little as $3 a month, you get your name in the credits of videos like this, as well as updates on videos in production, and the ability to suggest and vote on future runs to be covered. Moving forward, I'm planning on having either every other or every third video be chosen by patrons via a vote. It'll likely depend on the length of the runs chosen for how often this happens. But anyway, if you're a patron, you're able to suggest runs with this happens, and then every patron gets to vote for which ones they want to see most, like what happened with this Alien Isolation run. There's more available on Patreon as well, like if you support at the $6 tier, you also get access to monthly live Q&As, as well as a series where once a month, I watch an old video of mine and break down everything I think the video did and didn't do well, and take notes in the process, trying to improve the videos I make today by looking at the videos I made in the past. Honestly, I've learned a lot by doing that series, and a lot of what I've taken notes on, I've applied to videos like this one. Also, there's a $9 tier as well, which gets you access to everything I just talked about, as well as a monthly recap where I talk about pretty much everything that went on behind the scenes each month and my thoughts on things with videos. Contributing any amount of money, though, is entirely unnecessary, which is what makes those of you who do support the channel monetarily that much more special. So thank you again, all of you who are patrons. And don't forget to join my Discord server. It's super chill and inclusive there. We're just trying to have a good time. Back to the run, in the story of the game, we arrive to the Sevastopol to find the flight recorder, and after going on the elevator ride earlier, the station began falling apart with fire everywhere. And don't forget there's also aliens. We as Ripley have said, you know what, I think the closure isn't worth the hassle, and we're immediately trying to escape. The terminals Zeb hacked earlier were for docking the Torrens to the Sevastopol, and he's now on his way to detach the Torrens from the Sevastopol to escape. To finish up the run, he's going to try and do a skip called Double Pins. Zeb has two panels he has to activate via switches and key cards, which will spawn a briefcase with four pins in it that he has to activate, starting with the two on top. These pins are what will detach the Torrens from the Sevastopol. The prompts to activate the two top pins are both active at the same time, so what he's going to try and do is look at one and tap E to activate it, and the instant he taps E, he'll flick his camera to the right to the other pin. If done right and fast enough, this activates and plays the animation of both pins at the same time. The bottom pins will become interactable once both top pins are finished, so regardless of if he hits the first double pin, he's going to try and do it a second time on the bottom pins. Each double pin saves 15 seconds, meaning that there's a potential 30 second skill based time loss near the very end of the run, which, side note, isn't the last potential time loss of the run, there's more after it. Double pins isn't a terribly difficult trick, but it's not uncommon to fail due to the nerves of making it this far in a run. 
After all four pins, a cutscene starts where Ripley is confronted by three Steves, but she's able to secure herself to a rail and detach the Torrens in time. This will lead to a short section where Ripley has made it inside the Torrens and can rest easy. During the walking segment then, there's a potential glitch that can happen where you walk faster, saving 8.9 seconds. It's totally unknown why this happens, and seems to be completely luck-based whether you get it. So you could potentially have done everything perfect and had incredible facehugger luck all run, and then you lose almost 9 seconds here just based on a coin toss. For example, Zeb has done two runs that are faster than his world record, but they didn't have fast walk, so they're slower than the record overall. Unfortunately, what you're seeing right now is the slow walk. Zeb wasn't able to get the fast walk. At the end of the hallway, he'll open a door to see that a Steve has made it on board. Just like when a Steve has hit the second tower. There we go, got it that time, I guess. This causes a quick time event to play where Zeb is just going to hold down all the buttons in advance, causing the prompts to not even appear. The run officially ends when the screen cuts to black at the end of this moment. While this plays out, I'd like to give a huge thank you to both Zeb and Infomaster for helping make this video. I love insane speedruns with ridiculously high stakes like this one, and the two of them made making this video that much more enjoyable. Zeb also had this to say about this speedrun category. Wow inspiring. So thank you to Zeb for recording the run for this video, and thank you from the bottom of my heart to Zeb and Infomaster for helping make this video possible. If you want to learn more about Alien Isolation speedruns, or maybe learn a more reasonable to complete category for yourself like all missions, then head on over to speedrun.com and use that search bar. They have a super helpful Discord server that you can join from there, and I'm sure they would love to answer any questions you have. That's all for this video though. This was an any percent speedrun of Alien Isolation, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.